In this video, I'm going to be going through the obscure unsolved mystery iceberg. We'll cover topics like conspiracy theories, mysterious death and disappearance, pseudoscience, and much more. But before we get started, I just want to let everyone know that I'm going to leave the link to the iceberg in the description. So if anyone wants to read ahead, they can do so. Because in this video, I'm only going to be going through the first tier of this iceberg. So with all that out of the way, let's get started. Now this first topic is very simple. It's essentially just talking about how cameras and recording equipment seems to mess up and fail around paranormal entities. Cosmic censorship theory states that when a singularity forms, a black hole will form around the singularity, making it unobservable to anyone outside of the black hole. Angelology refers to the study of the nine classifications of angels from the Bible. I won't go too much into detail on this one because I feel like Wendigo has done a very good video covering the nine classifications of angels, so I'll leave a link in the description for that if anyone's interested. Sanpaku eyes is a Japanese term that was introduced around the 1960s, which refers to people where the white of your eye you can see on both sides of the iris, and then as well as below or above. It was believed by some to be a way for diagnosing conditions. For example, if you were able to see the white underneath the iris, that represented physical imbalance, and it was claimed to be present in alcoholics, drug addicts, and people who overconsumed on sugar and grains. And if the whites were visible above the iris, that represented mental imbalance, and it was claimed to be present in psychopaths and murderers or anyone rageful. In both conditions, it was believed that these people attracted violence and accidents. To quote the book, you are all Sampaku, from the man who coined the term, George Osawa. For thousands of years, people of the Far East have been looking into each other's eyes for signs of this dreaded condition. Any sign of Sampaku meant a man's entire system, physical, psychological, and spiritual, was out of balance. He had committed sins against the order of the universe, and he was therefore sick, unhappy, insane what the West has come to call accident prone. The condition of Sampaku is a warning, a sign from nature that one's life is threatened by an early and tragic end. Now, if you're there looking at your eyes and you've noticed that you are Sampaku, then don't worry because according to George, it can be cured with a microbiotic diet. So the liver is the body's filtration system. It converts toxins and waste products, cleanses your blood, metabolizes nutrients and drugs for the body. Well, some people believe that the liver needs to be detoxed to maintain healthy function, and that's where liver flushing comes in. Also, some people do it to lose weight because, I guess, I don't know. The Poe Toaster was a shadowy figure dressed in all black wearing a wide-brimmed hat and a white scarf, who for several years appeared at Edgar Allan Poe's grave on the early hours of January 19th, Edgar Allan Poe's birthday. He would pour himself a glass of cognac and raise a toast to Poe then vanish into the night, leaving three roses on the gravestone in a distinct arrangement, along with the remaining unfinished bottle of cognac. This became so widespread that people actually began to gather on Poe's birthday in hopes of seeing the man. However, he was rarely ever seen or photographed. Since the man began doing this in the 1930s, there wasn't really much opportunity for them to take pictures of him. The original toaster was believed to have done this every year beginning somewhere in the 1930s until his death in 1998, after which he passed his tradition on to his son. The reason we know all this is because of cryptic messages he left on the gravestone. In 1993, one of the letters said, the torch has passed. And in 1999, a note said that the original toaster had died and the tradition had been passed on to his son. Now I couldn't actually find what these letters were, but apparently the son had left some rather controversial letters on the gravestone. Apparently it got so bad that in 2006, onlookers tried to detain the son and <laughs> I guess question him and identify who he was. However, they weren't able to do that. And then after 2010, the toaster never showed up again. In 2016, the Maryland Historical Society elected a new toaster to continue the tradition. This refers to a picture that was originally posted on Reddit by the user Zombie Gaddafi. He claims that in the picture you can see his uncle during the 70s visiting the Grand Canyon with his friends. 
The photo was taken after they stopped by the side of the road to take some more pictures of the Grand Canyon. They said they were there roughly 15 minutes before leaving and after some time when the photos were developed, they noticed there was a man standing in the bushes right behind his uncle, who both his uncle and his friend swore they had never seen this man before and they never knew he was there at the time. But this one, some people just believe it's his uncle playing a trick on him or it was just some guy taking a piss in the bush. The silent man refers to a man in Swansea, England, who has been standing in the road blocking traffic for the past seven years and refuses to speak. In 2007, he was arrested and sent to jail for three years for doing this. And in 2020, when he was released, he was arrested again for standing in the same spot. The police did say that he can talk, he just refuses to. Padma is a woman who seems to have thousands of websites across the internet, with some having a face plastered over pictures of models. A lot of people have already covered this topic, so I'm not gonna go too much into detail for this one. Andrew Basiago is an American lawyer and 2016 presidential candidate, who claims he was a part of a secret project called Project Pegasus, run by DARPA, in which they achieved time travel and teleportation. Also, just a side note, during his presidential campaign, he proposed UFO disclosure and intelligent reform of Sasquatch protection, whatever that means. Now, during this Project Pegasus, he claimed to have teleported from a jump room made from reverse engineered alien technology. He also claims that on his team was Regina Dugan, the director of DARPA and Barack Obama. Now, obviously there's some people out there who believe him, but I also saw a few people theorizing that this was some strange coping mechanism that he has to deal with trauma as a child. In one of the interviews I watched, he explains that the reason he came out with all this information was because it was his father's dying wish and that his father utilized him as a time traveling pioneer. Now, since all of this stuff happened to him when he was a child, some people believe that this is just a weird coping mechanism to deal with abuse he dealt with as a child. So it seems like either he teleported to Mars as a child or he was abused and he's dealing with it in this way. Yeah. The Somerton Man was an unidentified body that washed up on the 1st of December, 1948, on the beach of Somerton Park in South Australia. At the time, there was nothing discernible on the man to identify who he was and how he had died. After conducting an autopsy, they didn't believe it was a natural death. However, they couldn't rule a cause of death. However, they theorized that maybe he had potentially been poisoned. However, a little over a year, a suitcase was discovered in the Adelaide railway station which had been checked in the day before the man appeared on the beach. So police believed it belonged to the Somerton man. In the suitcase was a red checkered dressing gown, size seven red felt pair of slippers, four pairs of underwear, pajamas, shaving items, a light brown pair of trousers with sand in the cuffs, an electrician screwdriver, a table knife, a pair of scissors, a small piece of zinc, which was believed to be a protector for the knife, and a stenciling brush, which is used by third officers on merchant ships for stenciling cargo. They also found a thread card, which carried the same thread that was used to repair the lining in the dead man's trouser pocket. Along with this, all the identification marks on the clothing had been removed. That was apart from the name T. Kine on a tie, Kine on a laundry bag, and Keen on a singlet along with three dry cleaning marks. The police theorized that whoever had removed the clothing tags had simply overlooked these items or the names on these items were left because they knew Kine wasn't the dead man's name. After this, a search concluded that no T Kines were missing and the dry cleaning marks led nowhere. One clue they gathered was from a coat which was found in the suitcase. From the way the coat was manufactured, it indicated that it had come from the United States. And since the coat had not been imported to Australia, it was believed that either the man had recently come from the United States, or he had bought the coat from someone who had been to the United States. After this time, a pathologist re-examined the body and found some new discoveries. 
namely how clean the man's shoes were, which didn't line up with the theories of where the man had been prior to his death. This led them to believe that the man had been killed somewhere else and then carried to the beach and left there, which would also explain the lack of vomit on the beach, since they theorized that if the man had been poisoned, a common symptom of poisoning is vomiting. Around this same time, they also found a tiny piece of paper sewn to the inside of the man's pocket, which read Tamam Shud, which translates to ended or finished, and is found on the last page of Rubayat of Omar Khayyam. After the police made an appeal to the public, they were able to find the original book that this piece of paper had been cut from. Now the book itself seemed important as the themes of the book talk about how you should live life to the fullest with no regrets, which seemed to corroborate with the theory that the man had taken his own life by poisoning himself. As if this case wasn't mysterious enough, on the last page of the book, they found indentations like when you write over paper and the pages underneath are left with an imprint. From the imprints they found two phone numbers and five lines of text, which they believed were code for something. One of the lines had a line through it, but judging from its similarities to the fourth line, it's believed it was a mistake. There's also an X in the middle which has been stricken out, and it's unclear whether that's significant to the code or not. After discovering the codes, they did try to decipher them, however they were unsuccessful with some experts believing it could just be mindless scribbles from a disturbed mind. The only real breakthrough with the codes came in 2004, when a retired detective believed that each letter stood for a word, and that the last code stands for, it's time to move to South Australia, Mosley Street. It seems that's as far as they got with the code. If you're wondering what the significance of Mosley Street is, if you recall, I mentioned they found two phone numbers along with the codes. Well, one of these numbers belonged to a woman named Jessica Thomas who lived on Mosley Street. When questioned by police, she told them that she didn't know the man or why he would have her number. However, she did report that an unidentified man had come looking for her in 1948 by speaking to her neighbours and asking for her. However, she wasn't in at the time. According to the initial investigator, when she was shown a cast of the Somerton man, she was, quote, completely taken aback to the point of giving an appearance that she was going to faint. This same sentiment was held by the man who created the cast and was there present at the time when she saw it, knowing that after she looked at the cast, she immediately looked away and would not look at it again. Towards the end of her life, she was interviewed about the man, with the interviewer stating that she was evasive, which made it hard to believe her, which led him to believe that she knew the man and even her own daughters believe that she knows the man. There were a few theories as to the man's true identity, ranging from him being a spy, a man called H.C. Reynolds, or a man called Carl Webb. Jessica Thomas's daughter also believed that he and her mum were spies, saying that this is what her mum had told her, along with the facts that she taught English to immigrants and was interested in communism and could speak Russian. The theory for him being H.C. Reynolds doesn't seem to hold much weight since it's based off the Somerton man looking similar to this other guy's identification cards. In 2022, they were able to find a DNA match for two distant cousins of the dead man from his hair, which indicated that he was a man by the name of Carl Webb. Carl was an electrical engineer who was fond of poetry, which may explain why he owned the book Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. He also enjoyed betting on horse races, which some believe that's what the codes are referring to. To me, the Carl Webb theory seems like the most believable, however, it doesn't explain why he had Jessica Thomas's phone number and why she would lie about it if she did know him. Also, South Australian police have yet to verify the DNA match. Okay, now we're into the conspiracy theories. So who built the moon? So this one is in reference to a book written by Christopher Knight and Alan Butler that theorized that humans from the future traveled back in time and built the moon. One of the things they point to is how perfectly the moon is suited for Earth and providing life by being exactly what it is and where it is. Some of the specific reasons Alan Butler claimed is that the moon is huge in comparison to Earth, which is uncommon for moons. The moon fits into the Earth's circumference 3.66 times. The moon also holds the Earth at a specific angle 
allowing the earth to be evenly warmed. The moon also prevents the earth from tipping over. He also points to lunar eclipses, where the moon blocks the sun perfectly. This is because the moon is one four hundredth the size of the sun, but it's also four hundred times closer to us. He believes that all these anomalies are signals from whoever built the moon, indicating to us that it was manufactured. Roman Empire never existed. So this one means what it says, that apparently the Roman Empire never existed, that all the Roman archaeological sites have just been misinterpreted over the years, and that Rome itself was a hoax perpetrated by the Spanish Inquisition. Now the main contributor of this theory is this woman on TikTok. Uh, I'll still talk I'll still talk a little bit about it even though she has been torn to shreds on TikTok at this point. So the TikToker is called Momillennial. So the main point she makes that everything that we believe to be Roman culture either comes from Greece, Anatoly, which makes up the majority of modern day Turkey, Asia and Egypt. She also claims that we have zero original copies of anything any Roman author wrote and that all the copies we do have today are medieval copies created in the 14th, 15th and 16th century by the church which the church claims to have burnt the originals after making copies. Now, just a little side note, I, I want to talk about some of the other theories that this woman has come up with. Those include Alexander the Great was actually a woman, Hadrian's Wall isn't actually a wall, it's a road, and the name Jesus Christ... <laughs> and the name Jesus Christ can be translated as Clitoris Healer. So sadly, I couldn't actually find the original TikToks of these However, I would have loved to have seen them. The mud flood theory is a conspiracy theory that states there was a catastrophic worldwide mud flood around the 1850s covering large portions of the earth. And evidence of this has been hidden by the powers that be. For what reason? I don't know. So this conspiracy theory seems to have originated on TikTok. Ah, essentially it's saying that the eight people who lost their life at the Travis Scott concert was a sacrifice or something I don't know but yeah this one's pretty ridiculous and insensitive so we'll move on the nine unknown is a 1923 novel by Talbot Mundy a secret society founded to preserve and develop knowledge that would be dangerous to humanity if it fell into the wrong hands the nine unknown men were entrusted with guarding nine books of secret knowledge the conspiracy theory comes from belief that these nine unknown men and the books are real so as read your mind is just talking about how sometimes you'll be thinking about you need to buy something or you want something however you'll never vocalize it but then you'll start noticing ads for it Russian elite's eyes glow in the dark is in reference to an event in Russia where Russian musician Sergei Shnurov was performing in front of unnamed Russian elites all of a sudden the lights went out and some of the elite's eyes were glowing in the dark. He said after this they were so scared they didn't play any more songs and they ran off stage. Another person there who witnessed it was Russian model Natalia Borianova. There's a video of her talking about it and in the video she claims that someone had told her that it was stem cells that was causing their eyes to glow. Now you've probably heard of this one, it seems to be fairly popular in recent years. It's a theory that states that the internet is mostly populated by bots and that most of the content on the internet is AI generated. It claims that most of what we assume to be human created content is actually AI generated. Wall Street witchcraft is in reference to how some people on Wall Street utilize strange techniques when investing. Some of those being astrology, psychics, magic, and other occult techniques. Okay, so this conspiracy theory is that Saturn is actually Satan and has been influencing Earth. Of the evidence is that Saturn represents the 666 mark of the beast. The three sixes being that it is the sixth planet. Its name represents the sixth day of the week, Saturday, and it has a six-sided polygon on its north pole. Now one of the points of evidence that I found when researching this was that Saturn sounds like Satan. And that's no coincidence. And that we've been worshipping Saturn for thousands of years. And that's why we exchange rings when we get married and place halos on godly figures. Okay, so this one kind of relates back to the mud flood theory. 
and states that everything we know about ancient architecture is completely wrong. The Tartarian Empire was supposedly an advanced ancient civilization that spanned the globe and that they were erased from history, either by mud floods or some other catastrophe or another nation destroyed them. And with their fall, all their great cities were destroyed and burned. And after the Great Reset, only a few examples of Tartarian architecture remained. However, they were falsely attributed to contemporary architects of their time. Tartarian architecture is usually attributed to anything ordained or pre-modern. I'll throw up some examples on the screen somewhere. Some people also argue that things like the pyramids and the Great Wall of China are also from the Tartarian Empire. Now for this one, I don't really understand how the most advanced world-spanning civilization could be destroyed and erased by another civilization. So with that being the case, I'm left to believe that they were either wiped out by the mud floods or some other catastrophe. However, if they were a globe-spanning civilization and they were wiped out by a catastrophe, then where did these humans that inhabit the Tartarian buildings now, where did they come from? I also saw some people argue that buildings with basements were evidence of mud floods because sometimes houses would have little windows to look into the basement and they would use that as proof that the building had been covered with mud and the rest of the building was underground. 20 detached human feet have been found along the coast of the Salish Sea in British Columbia, Canada and Washington. Some of the feet have been identified with some linking to people who either went missing or suffered from depression, leading some to believe that some of these people uh, tragically took their own lives. Another theory is that some of these people may have just died due to accidents near the coastline which caused their body to be washed away. What's even more bizarre is that in some of the cases, the pairs of feet would actually wash up together, which raised questions as to the probability of this happening, which is rather unlikely. The MV Joyita was a merchant ship that disappeared in the Pacific Ocean in 1955 along with its entire crew and passengers before it was mysteriously found again adrift with no one on board. The Joyita's journey began on the 3rd of October 1955 at 5am where she left the Samoan Appias Harbour bound for the Tokelau Islands roughly 230 miles away. The boat had actually planned to leave on the noon tide of the second. However, they were delayed because of engine failures. Ultimately, they decided to leave the next morning with just one working engine. Aboard the boat was 25 people total. 16 were crew members and nine were passengers. Along with them, there was a cargo of medical supplies, timber, various foodstuffs, and 80 empty 45 gallon oil drums. The ship had planned to land on the island by the 5th of October. However, by the 6th, there was no sign, which led the port on the island to report the ship was overdue. At this point, there'd actually been no distress signals sent from the boat. However, even so, a search and rescue team was still launched on the 6th, lasting to the 12th of October. The search and rescue teams combed roughly 100,000 square miles of ocean However, they found no signs of the ship. It wasn't until the 10th of November, five weeks later, when the Joyita was spotted by another merchant ship, roughly 600 miles west of their scheduled route. When the ship was found, it was partially submerged with no signs of their crew or passengers. Along with the missing crew, there was roughly four tons of cargo unaccounted for. One thing of note was that the recovery party had noted that the ship's radio was tuned into the frequency 2182 kilohertz, which is the International Marine Distress Channel. However, due to damage of the cables on the ship, the radio only had a range of roughly two miles. Some other strange findings from the recovery party were that they noted the barnacle growth on the side of the ship indicated that it had been submerged in this state for a prolonged time. They also noticed damage to the superstructure, which is essentially the building or housing on top of the boat. The bridge had been smashed and the deck house had some light damage and smashed windows. Also, the boat's dinghy and three life rafts were all missing. They also found that the one working engine in the ship was covered by a mattress and that the port side engine, the one which they were having troubles with initially, 
before departure was found partially disassembled, which showed that the vessel was still running on just a single engine at the time. Also the ship's logbook, sextant, mechanical chronometer, and other navigational equipment was all missing, along with the captain's firearm, which he kept on the boat. The electrical clocks on the ship, which were all wired to the ship's generators, had all stopped at 10.25 p.m. Also, the switches for the cabin lights and navigational lights were all left on, which implied that whatever happened to the ship happened at night. One of the only remains that was actually found on the ship from one of the passengers was a doctor's bag, which contained a stethoscope, a scalpel, and four lengths of bloodstained bandages. Although the lower decks of the ship were flooded, there wasn't actually any hull damage, so investigators were a little bit confused as to how the ship had flooded. It wasn't clear until the ship was returned to the harbour, where they found corrosion within a pipe in the raw water circuit that cools the engine by sucking in seawater. This corrosion was what allowed the lower decks to become flooded. And by the time the crew would have known about the flooding, the water would have already reached the engine room's floorboards, and by that point, it would be way too late. While boats are often fitted with pumps in the lower decks to dispel water, in the case of the Joy Ether, the pumps weren't fitted with strainers which allowed the pumps to become blocked, meaning it would be very difficult to remove all the water quick enough. After an inquest, they determined that the boat was in a poor state of repairs. However, they were still confused as to the disappearance of the crew. They couldn't understand why they would abandon the ship. While the lower levels of the ship had been flooded, the boat had never actually sank due to its buoyancy from its cork lining and its cargo of empty oil drums. They also placed a lot of blame on Captain Miller for being reckless and setting off on this trip with only one working engine and the overall lack of repairs of the boat. Now I did see a couple theories as to the course of events. One of the theories states that Captain Miller was well aware of the ship's buoyancy and would never abandon the ship. So the theory goes that he was either incapacitated or injured to the point where he couldn't reassure the remaining crew and passengers of the buoyancy of the boat. Now, one piece of evidence for this theory comes from Captain Miller's friend, who explained that there was a lot of tension between Captain Miller and his first mate, a man by the name of Chuck Simpson. Now, some speculate that these two came to blows during the trip, and Captain Miller was either incapacitated or thrown overboard, leaving the ship with an unexperienced crew. Now, some of the theories also believe that either the Japanese killed them, or that they were killed by pirates, which would explain why some of the cargo was missing. Another theory was that it was an insurance fraud by Captain Miller, who was amassing a large amount of debt at the time. However, this doesn't really explain why the entire crew, along with himself, would go missing. Also, the money that he would have earned from this successful trip would have earned him enough money to pay off his debts anyway. Another one of the theories goes that there was a mutiny, and as the boat began to take on water, Captain Miller tried to press on, eager to reach land and clear his debts. However, this caused the crew to argue with a fight breaking out and Captain Miller sustaining injuries, which is where the blood-covered bandages come in. Now with Captain Miller incapacitated, Chuck Simpson took over and decided to abandon ship, taking the navigational equipment, logbook, supplies, along with all the passengers and crew. Now the biggest problem with this theory seems to be as to why Chuck Simpson would choose to abandon the ship favor of surfing on a little dinghy in the middle of the Pacific Ocean with 40 mile an hour winds. Some believe that maybe they had spotted a nearby island and they believed that they could reach it on the dinghies, however they were swept into the open ocean due to the high winds. Till this day is still unclear as to the exact timeline of events that happened that night and in 2012 all missing passengers and crew were officially declared dead. The Oyakia craziness refers to the Dyatlov Pass incident. Now, I'm not going to go too much into detail on this one because it has been widely covered. However, I will summarize the events. In 1959, a group of 10 experienced ski hikers began a 14-day expedition up the northern Ural Mountains. During the first couple days, one of the hikers actually became sick and had to call off the hike and returned home. And he would be the only remaining survivor of the original 10. From diaries and cameras around their last campsite, we were able to piece together some things. A couple days into the hike, the team had set up camp and sat down for dinner around 7 p.m. Shortly after this, something went catastrophically wrong 
and the group didn't relay back to their club after the initial end date of the expedition had passed, red flags were raised before families and hikers demanded that search and rescue teams went and looked for them. Searchers initially found a badly damaged tent that had been torn down one side and covered in snow, with all the belongings and shoes still inside the tent. Investigators said that the tent had actually been cut open from the inside and the hikers within had fled into the night. They found a chain of eight or nine sets of footsteps left by several people wearing socks, a single shoe or barefoot. These footprints led down towards the edge of nearby woods. At the edge of these woods, the small remains of a fire were found along with the first two bodies. The medical examiner indicated that one of these bodies had been moved after death. Three more of the hikers were found just a few days later in between the distance from the tent to the nearby woods. The poses that these three were found in suggested that they were trying to return back to the tent. The examiner found no injuries on their bodies which would lead to death and concluded that they had died of hypothermia. However, one of the hikers actually did have a crack in his skull. However, it was deemed that it was non-fatal. The remaining four hikers were found two months later, roughly 50 meters away from the forest and under four meters of snow. The three of these four did have fatal injuries, ranging from major skull damage to chest fractures. However, there didn't appear to be any external wounds. There was a couple oddities with these four, namely that one of them was actually missing their tongue and one of their sweaters was tested to be radioactive. The crawlers are a commonly sighted cryptid with pale skin, long limbs and tall thin bodies. Sightings of these creatures are typically within America and more specifically North America. And if any of you out there have played Until Dawn, the Wendigos in that are inspired by crawlers. The fern flower is a magical flower from Baltic, Estonian and Slavic mythology. The flower is said to bloom on the dawn of the summer solstice and die before dawn. It is said that whoever finds the flower during bloom will be granted great wealth and wishes, and in some instances the ability to understand animal speech. However, this task is not so easy, as the fern flower is said to be protected by demons and witches during its bloom. Not deer is a little different from other cryptids, as it's not a completely unknown animal, rather it takes the form of a deer. And the way you can spot them is they have different characteristics and unnatural behavior, which you wouldn't see in a normal deer. Now, some of those different characteristics include things like forward facing eyes, an unnaturally long neck, misshapen head, or the deer moving in an unnatural way. Similar to the crawler sightings of these not deer are typically seen within America. Flesh gates is just another term used to refer to skinwalkers which are a type of cryptid said to have the ability to transform their bodies and mimic the voices of others. It does this so it can lure humans to them so it can eat them. They're most commonly sighted near or within national parks in America, with some believing they're linked to the many disappearances and strange events within missing 411 cases. For those who don't know, missing 411 cases are a series of cases around documenting people that have gone missing in or around national parks. If those people are found again, they are often found with no memory of what happened or in weird locations, like miles away or miles up in elevation from where they went missing. Now going back to the skinwalkers, they originate from Native American culture and are believed to be evil witches that have the ability to turn into and possess animals. Being Native American in origin, little is known about the lore of skinwalkers as they aren't very open with discussing this with outsiders. The Nobody is a figure alive today said to carry the name of Jesus. They have extraordinary spiritual powers and the ability to control reality consciously and subconsciously. It was actually kind of hard to find anything on this because when I searched up The Nobody, the Bob Odenkirk film came up. Also the article that the original iceberg linked to was kind of vague. Who is buying all the glitter is a conspiracy theory that began in 2018 when a manager from Glitterex, which is the leading manufacturer of glitter, made some mysterious comments about their top buyer. They said they couldn't disclose the buyer and that you wouldn't be able to know it was glitter if you saw it. And when asked if you'd be able to see the glitter, she replied, you'd be able to see something. So obviously this left people to speculate which industry was buying up all the glitter and doesn't want the public to know about it. So some of the theories were talking about how glitter can be in paints or explosives. 
and how it can be used to trace manufacturers. However, that's already public knowledge, so it wouldn't explain why she wanted to be so secretive about it. So this one is a reference to people trying to find the original image of the famous Jeff the Killer image. One of the theories is that it originates from 4chan's B board, with a girl spamming photos of herself, asking if she looked pretty, which led one user to download and edit the photo into the Jeff the Killer image, with the message, now you are. However, the website Know Your Meme has a different origin, marking its origin from a Japanese website where two different versions of the image were found, and this seems to be the oldest record of the image. The most mysterious song on the internet is a song that originally played on German radio between 1982 and 1984. The mystery comes from us knowing nothing about the people who made the song, what year it was recorded, and even the original name of the song. I'll leave a link to the song in the description if anyone is interested. Mystery booms is a phenomenon occurring from loud explosions or booming noises that cause windows to break and houses to shake. The article that the iceberg links to mentions how that most of these sounds are unknown in origin. However, when I read through the article, some of these noises did have explanations. They gave examples of some of them being caused by explosions, earthquakes, and lightning. They also explained that some of them can come from sonic booms from planes and military exercises. Chris Benoit was a WWE professional wrestler who in 2007 seemed to have a psychotic break where he unfortunately murdered his wife and child before hanging himself. It was believed the cause could possibly be due to CTE which is brain damage you get from repeated blows to the head along with steroid and alcohol abuse. The strange thing about this is roughly 14 hours before police discovered the bodies, there had been an edit to his Wikipedia page stating how he wouldn't be coming to an upcoming event due to the death of his wife. What made things even stranger is when police traced the IP address of the person who edited the Wikipedia, they found it originated from Stamford, Connecticut, which is also the location of the WWE headquarters. The police ended up seizing the computer of the man who made the edit and ultimately deemed he wasn't involved and declined to press charges and the whole thing was just chalked up as a coincidence. Machine elves, also known as DMT elves, are the entities that many people seem to experience when they take DMT. Often many people, even without communicating, will experience these same entities when taking DMT. I'll also put some pictures on screen to show how people have described these machine elves to look like. I don't know how to pronounce this, so I'm not even going to attempt it. But it refers to a door inside a temple of the same name. This temple is in India and it is a shrine to the Hindu deity Vishnu. And underneath, within the temple, there are six vaults named after the letters A through to F. In 2011, the Supreme Court anointed a seven-man team to go through the vault and take stock of all their treasure to account for their total worth. Of the six vaults, only five were opened. Inside the five that were opened, they found mountains of treasure, from gold coins to diamond necklaces. The total value seemed to range from $20 billion and upwards. Of the six vaults, the only vault that remained closed was Vault B. Now the team did actually attempt to open Vault B, and they managed to get through the first wooden door. Behind the wooden door, there was a second door, an iron door, which they also managed to get through but it was the third door that remained closed. While they were still attempting to open the third door, the royal family actually stepped in and managed to stop them. And since then, the Supreme Court has refused to open the vault, stating that it's an issue involving religious sentiment. Now, obviously, this has left a lot of people to speculate what's behind the door, with theories ranging from untold riches to UFOs. There's also one theory that states that the door is connected to the Arabian Sea, and if it was to open, the entire surrounding area would be flooded. Greek fire is a lost technology used by the Byzantine Empire around 600 to 1200 AD. It was commonly used on weapons mounted on ships where they would spray the gel-like fire onto enemy ships. But around 1300 AD, all mention of this technology seemed to stop. It's believed that with the decline of the empire, the technology was eventually lost, but modern experts believe it to be similar to modern day napalm due to its ability to keep burning on the surface of water and it being extremely difficult to extinguish. 
Susie's Dying is an urban legend that when you're dialing a number from a public telephone box, if you enter a specific string of numbers that's undetermined, you'll hear unusual and disturbing messages. It seems that the entity possesses you and gives you a strong urge to dial these numbers. On the call, you'll hear a woman repeat, help me, help me, Susie's dying, over and over again. In 1593, a night after the assassination of Governor Gomez Perez de Marinas by Chinese pirates, a soldier in the Spanish army was stationed in the Philippines when he began to feel dizzy and exhausted. He leaned against the wall and rested for a moment, and when he opened his eyes, he was back in Mexico City, thousands of miles across the ocean. Some of the guards in the area found him wearing the wrong uniform, so they began to question him. He explained to them about the assassination and how he had just been in the Philippines but moments ago. Since this was the 1500s, news of the assassination hadn't actually reached New Mexico by this time. So because of this, he wasn't actually believed and he was in prison for being a deserter. It wasn't until months later when a ship arrived carrying the news of the governor's assassination. Also aboard that ship was a passenger who actually knew the man who had supposedly teleported and said that he recognized the man from his time in the Philippines. And after this, the man was released by the authorities. In 1872, a construction team unearthed a strange egg-shaped stone covered in pictographs of unknown origin. The symbols carved into the stone includes arrows, the moon, spirals, an ear of corn, a teepee, and a large face on one side. Because of these symbols, it's believed to be Native American in origin. However, some researchers believe it could be Celtic or Inuit since they found similar artifacts in other parts of the world and this was the first of its kind found in the United States. As of today, it's still unclear as to the true origins of the stone. Jetpack Man is an unidentified flying object that has been observed at least five times within the LA area between 2020 and 2021. Multiple airplane pilots have reported seeing the Jetpack Man of altitudes upwards of 5,000 feet. The first sighting happened on the 30th of August, 2020, when two pilots reported seeing a man hovering in a jetpack above LAX at roughly 3,000 feet. The second believed sighting was in November, when an LA helicopter recorded what seemed to be a Jack Skellington balloon floating above the city. The third sighting was by China Airlines in October, when they reported seeing a flying object that appeared to be a flight suit jetpack at 600 feet. The fourth was in December, when a pilot and flight instructor captured a flying object 3,000 feet near Polos Verdes and the Catalina Islands, south of LA. The fifth sighting wasn't until July 2021, when a pilot reported seeing a man in a jetpack roughly 5,000 feet off the coast of California. The leading theory is that it's a balloon in the shape of a man in a jetpack or a drone. However, drones don't typically fly at the high altitudes that some of the pilots report seeing these objects at. And that's everything on the first tier of the iceberg. Now, I just wanna say, if anyone actually made it this far in the video, thank you so much for watching the whole thing. You can probably tell I'm kinda of new to filmmaking, so if anyone wants to leave any advice or tell me what they thought in the comments, I'd love to hear it. Also, if anyone wants me to continue going through the iceberg making videos just like this, then please let me know. Also, if anyone is interested, I do stream on Twitch almost every day. So if anyone is interested in coming by and watching, then I'll leave a link in the description. So if you are interested, come on by and <laughs> let me know how much you liked or hated the video. Either is fine. Well, I guess that is uh, everything for this video. Again, thank you so much for watching and uh, yeah, I will see you in the next one. Bye.